Hales family, thanks for joining us for this week's online teaching. The very first time that someone stood up to tell other people about Jesus, he made it very clear that this gospel, the good news, is for everyone. It was a great day. Some people call it the birthday of the church. The Spirit of God had swept through the disciples, those gathered in the upper room. They, had the, they were filled with the Spirit of God. They were filled with joy. And their leader, Peter, stands up. And in just a few weeks before this, he had been crying out of embarrassment and shame because he had lied, he had denied Jesus. But here he is, something has happened in him. And he says that this something, this, this joy, what God is doing in the world, redemption, is not just for him. But he says in Acts 2 that the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. It was for everyone. And today we are starting a new teaching series. We're going to be going through the Gospel of Luke. And we're calling it Good News for All People. Good News for All People. In Luke's Gospel, we see a Savior who is for all people. He is for the outcast, for the sinner, for the unimportant, for the overlooked. The Savior has come for everyone. And reading the Gospel of Luke, as we go through, we'll get the impression that though we, we live 2,000 years removed, a different culture, different language, different time, that people 2,000 years ago, very similar to us today, struggled with this, the same types of things. They, they struggled with, with sin and uh, money and anxiety and, and hope and community, rejection, vengeance, pride, humility, discerning God's directions, all these things that, that we struggle with in the first century, they struggle with these exact same things. And, and as, so as we go through this series, it's going to be, we're, we're going to learn about Jesus. Obviously, he's, he's the center. He is the focus. It's his story. It's not our story. But along the way, we, we will see how this good news impacts our lives at every step of the way. I wanted to, to make you aware, I always like to, to bring out my sources. Uh, of most of, a lot of what I say, it's not original. It's not original with me. In fact, if you come across a preacher who is very original, <laughs> I, I would stay clear. I would stay clear of them. But uh, just a couple resources. I, I've tried to, to hear from a variety of perspectives and backgrounds. So one is Diane Chen. She was born and raised in Hong Kong. She's now a professor of New Testament at Palmer Seminary. Uh, another one is uh, Thibidi Anya Boali. He was a former Muslim, now he's a pastor in Southeast D.C. And Daryl Bach, he's a professor of New Testament at Dallas Seminary. So just a, a few different uh, resources that I'll be using throughout this, throughout this series as we go. So let's, we're going to jump in, and, and as we go, uh, in order for us to get started, to get a good framework, uh, today is probably going to be more information and inspiration. The, so I, there's no guarantees that you won't be inspired at some point along the way. But in order to get started, we've got to get some background. We have to get some, some context for what is happening in the Gospel of Luke. Step back, get a big picture for a moment. So that's what we're going to be doing uh, today. So a, a couple of uh, just kind of baseline facts, quick facts about the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, it is the longest gospel we have, not by chapters, but by verses. It's, it's unique and that it has a, a sequel. It's the only gospel account that has a sequel. So we have Luke and then we have Acts. It's unfortunate that they are not together in, in the Bible. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. But Luke and Acts are really two volumes, the same, same author. The, gos the gospel of Luke explains who Jesus was, what he did, why he came. 
and how he prepared the disciples for the role that they would have in that plan. It, and one of the, the major concerns throughout the, the Gospel of Luke is, is the relationship of Jews and Gentiles and Gentiles to the Gospel and how they are uh, become included in the story, especially in, in the book of Acts. And so Luke, Luke is setting this foundation and is asking some of these, answering some of these questions that Gentiles might have, that Jews might have about this. So like, how, how did an originally Jewish movement become the basis for an offer of salvation to all? And if Jesus was originally the Messiah for Israel, how was it that he met with so much opposition along the way? Even more, how could a crucified Messiah become the basis for hope for all humanity? And so today, we want to look, we're going to start in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to go through from the first verse to the last verse. Uh, not today, I mean in this, in this series. Today, we're going to cover just one sentence. And you're thinking, Matthew, if we're just going to cover one sentence a week, it's going to take us a while to get through the Gospel of Luke. Well, yes, you, you, you aren't wrong. It's going to take us a while to get through the Gospel of Luke. But today, we're looking at one sentence in the Greek language, which is actually four, the very first four verses in the English translation. So we're going to jump in the, the first four verses. This is a prologue to the rest of, of the book. So Luke chapter 1, verse 1. So many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that had been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Right off the bat, we have to say that we're not sure who the author of the Gospel of Luke is, even though it is attributed to Luke. Uh, we do know that this, the, whoever wrote Luke also wrote uh, the book of Acts. Acts begins in almost the same, same fashion. So Acts 1 verse 1 says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So you can, you can see the, the parallels there. You can, you can see the authors writing to Theophilus, Volume 1, Volume 2. However, we're not sure who the author is. It, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference Like as we're interpreting. It, it probably was Luke. From the early days of the church, it's been attributed to Luke. And so that's, that's kind of what a tradition gives us. And if that is the case, and I think a case can be made for that, then who, who was Luke? Who was Luke? Luke was a traveling companion of Paul's on his missionary journeys. He was a doctor by trade. And Luke shows up in, in several of Paul's letters. So, for example, in Colossians 4, it says, Our dear friend Luke the doctor. Paul mentions him uh, in his letters to Timothy and Philemon. And, and then in the book of Acts, there are, are portions where the pronouns change from third person to first person pronouns. You're like, Matthew? What are you talking about? Well, for example, in Acts 16, here it says briefly, uh, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia when they, that's third person, came to the border of Mysia. They tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. And then just a couple verses later, Luke, Luke has joined them. The, the author has joined them, we believe, because it says, after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave. From Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So it was they, they were doing this, them, and then Luke joins them and now he's on the journey with them. And so it, for the next uh, little bit in the book of Acts, it's the first person, we, us, going, going through. And so for the sake of clarity, I'm going to refer to Luke as, as the, the author to keep things clear. But whoever, whoever he was, he was an educated man, he was a cultured man, and the first real historian to write about Jesus. Uh, Diane Chen says, says this about him. She says, The sophistication of the Greek pose of Luke Acts points to a highly educated individual who was simultaneously at home in the Greco-Roman culture and philosophy and well-versed in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. 
And then speaking of the first four verses of, of Luke, she says, these verses comprise a single elegant Greek sentence. It's vocabulary and structure indicating a highly educated author. And so this, this first four verses in the Gospel of Luke is a prologue. And, and uh, this kind of introduction at the beginning of a work in antiquity in the Greco-Roman world was, was not uh, uncommon. In fact, it, you would have these kind of prologues at the beginning of histories and biographies and uh, rhetorical writings. And Luke, Luke is trying to learn this right off the bat that this is something solid. This is something you can trust and, and readers would know. Uh, whoever came across this gospel would know that this was, this was a, a serious work. This, this was not just a, a fly-by-night, haphazardly put together account. Like some work had gone in into this. Uh, Luke, it, right off the bat, he, he admits though that he's, he's not the first one. He's not the only one to, to write an account. He says in verse 1, many have undertaken to draw up an account. And yet, and he doesn't disparage them. But what he's saying is, like, they, they've written up an account and he's saying, I've done my own work. I've done my own research here uh, to put together. I've used reliable resources and, and traditions he has access to. And he, he creates this, uh, this beautiful work that we now have um, in helping us understand the Jesus story. And he tells us in these verses that he's carefully investigated the account of Jesus. Um, he, he didn't see Jesus himself. He, he himself was not an eyewitness, but he's carefully investigated. He's relied on eyewitness testimony. And, and this is um, one, of, one of the reasons there, there's uh, so much in the Gospel of Luke that is unique to the Gospel of Luke. Because we have, we have four accounts of the life of Jesus that we call the Gospels. And three, we call the Synoptic Gospels because they're, they're similar. So that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke are, are similar. And then you have John, who is utterly different than the others, but still tells the, about the, the life and death and resurrection of, of Jesus. but just uses a different, different style. Uh, but of the, so you have the, the synoptics, and of those, there's some similar materials between the, the Gospels. I'll, I'll put up a graphic here, and don't take too much time looking at it. <laughs> the main thing is they, they share some content, and they all have some unique content. And Luke of the synoptic Gospels has the most uh, unique uh, content. That is the, the most that is not found in um, the other synoptic gospels not found in Matthew or Mark that are unique to Luke. In fact, 35% of Luke is not found elsewhere. And this, this is probably because of the extensive work and, and research that he has done. But, but why has he been so meticulous? He tells us. Verse 4, we, we read it. He says, I too decided to write an orderly account for you most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. He writes so that his friend Theophilus might know the certainty of what he's been taught. Another translation says, so you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt the reliability of what you've been taught. So Theophilus, here's again someone that we don't know uh, too much about, except that uh, he, has a, he has a cool name. And he was probably a, a Gentile from Luke's, the way that Luke addresses him, when he calls him most excellent. And for some unholy reason, when I hear that, all I can think of is a Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Excellent! I'm dating myself there a little bit, and, and hopefully you, you remember more than just that uh, little, little clip there. But he says most excellent, and this was a, a title used amongst uh, Gentiles and, and esteemed Gentiles. And so as a Gentile, or, and by Gentile we mean he, he wasn't a Jew, a non-Jew. He was outside of God's covenant promises, right? The, uh, Israel, they had the, the promises, Abraham, the, the covenants, a Gentile. He was outside of that. He, he wasn't part of that covenant. And so he, he's, he's likely a new believer. And maybe he's, he's wrestling with the story a little bit. Maybe he's, he doesn't quite have certainty. And, and, and so uh, Luke writes to help them. Because maybe 
Theophilus is thinking, like, do I, do I really belong here? Is it salvation for me? Is it just for the Jews? And if Jesus is the Messiah, if he is the king, why was he, he crucified? And is, is, is it credible? Is this account credible? Because in, in our culture, in our time, we give preference to new. Like whatever is the latest, the greatest, the best, like that's, like we want, that's what we want. In the ancient society, they gave preference to things that had been around for a while. And so while Jesus was, was new on the scene, so to speak, Luke is assuring him that this is not just a, a, a recent thing. Like this, this has history, there's fulfillment here. We'll, we'll talk about that in, in a moment. And, and it, it wasn't like there weren't plenty of other religious options for Theophilus, for the Gentiles in the Roman world. Religions uh, uh, abounded. So, and this, so just some, some speculation here, just doing some work based on what we know. Probably a Gentile, he's not too certain of, of this whole gospel story yet and he's facing some doubts and I think this is instructive for us like as we read this as we go through the gospel of Luke that we would have certainty in in what we believe knowing um, that our our faith while it does take faith to believe that Jesus died and rose again for us there, there's absolutely faith involved that Jesus was a very real person a very real time in history, a very real people. And um, it doesn't mean there's no room for, for doubts and, and questions. If you've been around the Hills Church, you know that, that we want to be a place that is open to questions and the people's doubts. And, and you don't have to have it all 100% figured out to, to be part of our community at the Hills Church. And, but we've said before that, that faith it's not a leap in the dark. It is a step into the light. And that's what I think Luke is trying to offer us. And that's where he sets out in, in this prologue, in his first sentence, to give some assurance of, of what we are reading. But we are 2,000 years removed. It's easy to, to look back, to think of the ancients as maybe um, gullible. Maybe they didn't get the story right. Maybe they were making something up to promote their their own agenda and power, which they didn't have any of even after writing um, this. And and so we and and so there's, there's people that, that doubt the, the accounts of the gospels, um, who think the stories are, are just fairy tales. For example, uh, Tanahasi Coates in his book Between the World and Me, he tells of being a young man and, and well in Baltimore, a young man coming and pulling a gun on him. And this was uh, Mr. Coates' response. He says, I could not retreat, as did so many, into the church and its mysteries. My parents rejected all dogmas. We would not kneel before their God. My understanding of the universe was physical, and its moral arc bent toward chaos, uh, then concluded in a box. And then later on, he writes, you must resist the common urge toward the comforting narrative of divine law, toward fairy tales that imply some irrepressible justice. So Coates, he is an atheist. He calls religious beliefs fairy tales, and I, I'm not mad at him for that. I'm just merely pointing out that um, there, there are people who think of her faith, think of the Gospels, as as fairy tales. And he didn't he didn't say the Gospel accounts. I think he was. Uh, talking about religion in in general being being fairy tales, but Luke isn't asking us to just take it on trust. He is appealing to a a base of, of evidence here that that he has come across, and and the first ground of evidence to the truth of the gospel is this theme of promise and fulfillment that we will see throughout Luke's gospel, promise and fulfillment, and we'll see this developed, and, and so we'll talk about this as we go. But let me give just a, a cursory look at this for a moment. In verse 1, again, it says, Many have undertaken to drop an account of the things that have been fulfilled. Have been fulfilled among us. The, the word, it's, uh, you could say, accomplished. And why, why didn't he just say happened? The things that happened among us. Because uh, for Luke, as, as he is interpreting the, the events, and as the early Jesus followers were interpreting the events, to them, the events in the life of Jesus didn't just happen. 
It, it didn't just happen. The, the Jesus story didn't begin in the manger. It was the, the culmination of God's plan to redeem a broken world. And, and what, what had happened was, <laughs> is, is what had been promised. So Luke, he's referring to, to promises in the Old Testament. We talks about fulfillment, that things had been promised. And so one way of, of looking at Scripture, we talk about the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, is that in the Old Testament, it is promises made, and the New Testament, it promises kept. So you have promises made and promises kept, and, and the Old Testament looks forward to God keeping the promises that he made to, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to, to David. And the New Testament books, like Luke's, Luke's Gospel, record for us how God kept his word, how he fulfilled his promises, so promises made and, and promises kept. And, and if Christianity is, is certain, then we would expect there to be this aspect of fulfillment of these promises made, that, that claims uh, made in the past have been fulfilled in Jesus. And, and so, it's like I said, the, what we have in the Gospels, it's more than just a reporting of current events. These things didn't just happen. They're, they're, they're foreseen and they're promised. And, and this, is, this is one of the major things in Luke's gospel, that the plan of God has been fulfilled in Jesus. And we don't have time to go into detail today. We'll see this idea repeated. And in, in our microchurches, I'll have some, some resources to look at, at, at some of these passages that talk about promise and fulfillment. So we'll make sure you have a microchurch to get this uh, uh, insider information. I'm not, I'm not trying to keep it from you. I just, I just don't have time looking at my, my clock here and it is dwindling. But this idea of promise and, and fulfillment, Luke says, like, look, look at that if, if you are, are questioning. But somebody just like, wait, 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 wait a minute. That's that circular reasoning. You can't say Christianity, you can trust Christianity because the Bible tells me so. And I would say that's a, that's a fair critique. Right, that's a, a fair critique. Anybody could could write something and then uh, write a follow up where you're filling in the holes and, and the gaps and saying, "Well, fulfill this happened to fulfill," because you already know what was promised, right? So, um, so I do, while I do think that's helpful, maybe we could use a bit more. And Luke provides us with a bit more. That the second line of evidence for the truth of the gospel is the eyewitness accounts and verifiable history. And so, so Luke is is not just uh, relying on on hearsay but is, is getting eyewitness uh, accounts. And uh, when we think of like getting oral tradition and, and eyewitness accounts, it's a, it's a little different than, than it was in the ancient world. So for example, a preeminent New Testament scholar, N.T. Wright, he talks about these, these eyewitnesses that the gospel writers would have used and, and he describes it in this way. He says, imagine a village in Palestine or Palestine. They didn't have printed books or newspapers, television, radio, uh, no Google, no way to fact check. But what they did have were official storytellers. Some great event would happen, an earthquake, a battle, a visit of an emperor. Within a day or two, the story would be told all around the village and it would settle into a regular form. Everyone would know the story, that some of the better storytellers in the village would be recognized by others as the right people to tell it. And so that's what they do. They, they wouldn't change the story. They wouldn't modify it. Because if they did, people would notice. People, people would say something. They would speak up. And, and perhaps the, the closest thing that we have to this is like if maybe your family's gathered around. It's, maybe it's a holiday, a family reunion, or maybe even like celebrating someone's life who's, who's passed away. And the family gathers, and you're like, hey, Uncle Jim, tell this story of... And they tell everyone knows the story. Uncle Jim tells a story, he, um, you know, in his own, his own way, um, and so this this happens in families. So, for example, in, in our immediate family, like Laura and I now have been uh, married for almost 20 years, been together for about 22 years, and so we've we've lived a good portion of our lives together, and and we've experienced the same same events, um, and and so Laura. We like to tell stories about things that have happened. And it's very important that I'm there when she's telling these stories because sometimes her, her way of telling the story and, and the details and the facts, like <laughs> it, needs, it needs my perspective to, to bring out, hmm, 
that's probably not, I probably should just move on. Uh, so he had this whew, uh, storytellers in the villages who, who, would, who would tell these stories, eye, eyewitnesses, and, and the verbal word that was passed along was accepted even more so than the written word at time. Uh, it was interesting, uh, 500 years before this, I think it was about when Plato, Socrates, those guys uh, lived, and and Plato's, you, you can you can fact check this, you can Google this, like written word versus uh, just memory and recitation, and they preferred memory because when you write things down, like you can't, that's hard to verify. That's hard to verify. So what I'm what I'm trying to get at is that ancient people knew how to pass along information, and Luke says he relied on I witness accounts and so when when he writes the accounts those those eyewitnesses would have been around and so like as the story is being told people would have brought correction if those things had not happened and, and so all the gospel accounts including Luke include eyewitness reporting and again we don't have time we'll look at these a bit in, in micro church but just some of some of the names like there's no reason that people are, are given names throughout the gospel for, for certain things unless they were eyewitnesses. Unless you could say like, hey, go ask so-and-so. Have them verify. So you have Simon of Cyrene and his, his sons. He was the father of Alexander and Rufus. You have Malchus. You have Bartimaeus. You have Joanna. You have Cleopas. You remember Cleopas, right? It was Cleopas. Cleopas was one of the two people walking with Jesus after the resurrection. Um, and, and, and not everybody knows yet that Jesus has been raised from the dead, but they're walking along the road to Emmaus. Jesus shows up, starts talking to him, and one of them is named, and one is not. I don't know if the one who's not was salty about it or not years later, but Cleopas is named. And the only reason when you're writing a gospel, when you're writing a count, if you're writing fiction, you either name both of them, or you don't name either of them. But if, if you, you include one name, you only do that if, if you're including like the source of who, who told you. So we, we believe Cleopas was a, an eyewitness to, to the account. So talking about the reliability of, of Christianity, reliability of the Gospels, is that the Gospels are rooted in real historical events. We'll see this throughout the Gospel of Luke. He gives us as a historian, he, he's pointing out leaders and who's in charge and, and governors. So in, in Luke 3, for example, he says, In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, while Pontius Pilate was governor, Herod was tetrarch, his brother Philip tetrarch, Licinius tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priest. Like, he, he's giving us context. He's giving us history. Like, this, what we have in the Gospels is it's not fairy tale. It's not made up. Eyewitnesses who could, who could rebuff uh, accounts and things that were not true, uh, real, real people. And uh, Pastor Thabiti, in his, his book, he says, to be a Christian is to be a thinking being and to think most deeply about the most profound things, the nature of God and the ways of God in the universe. And so my, my encouragement for us, so today is it's introductory, so it's a lot of information, maybe not so inspirational today, we'll, we'll get there. Um, but to know that the story is grounded in, in truth and that our, our faith is not just a matter of, of trust, but our faith is a matter of what we are trusting in, what we are trusting in. Uh, your faith is only as good as the object that our faith rests on and so that we can be confident. And as Luke wrote to Theophilus, so that you can have certainty of the things you have been taught, as we go throughout the Gospel of Luke, my, one of my prayers is that we would have certainty of the things we have been taught as we get to know our Savior in a deeper way. Grace.